everyone. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship here at Washington Street Church of Christ. We are so glad you're here with us. Uh, we're going to begin our worship in song. If everyone would please stand. Father, we 
humbly come before you this morning and seek in your presence, Father, here in this place. We know that your spirit is with us. We pray that our worship is offered up to you in a true and, and, and sincere manner. Father, we're thankful that everything we have, all that's good in our life, Father, comes from you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to pray for one another, the opportunity to encourage one another, the opportunity to be there and, and help one another. Father, as a family, Father, that's, a, that's what we're supposed to do. Help us be mindful of that, always looking for opportunities to serve, allowing you to work through us, Father, and do those things that we need to be done. We know that there, there are those probably that are not able to be with us this morning for whatever reason, Father, for health reasons or what, whatever may be the case, Father, we pray for them. We pray that you'll give them a good day and strengthen them. And, and if they're facing trials, Father, we pray that you'll be with them. Through them. We're just so thankful for the blessings in our life, Father, for each and every one of them. You've blessed us beyond measure. I pray, Father, that we don't take them for granted. I pray that you'll continue to watch over this congregation, help it to continue to grow. As there's not many empty seats here this morning, that's a good thing. We're thankful for each one here, Father. We pray that each one feels like a part of this family. We're seeking to become a member, Father. We pray that that soon happens, Father. That everyone has a place. The door is open. Help us to uh, use the talents you've given us, Father, to bring honor and glory to you. Father, we live in a world that's uh, very challenging day-to-day -day basis, Father. We pray that you'll help us to be strong. Well, Father, we're very prone to, to make mistakes and falling into traps that causes us to sin. That's why we seek you, Father, to, for that forgiveness that we need on a daily basis. Father, we know that you love us. You've done so many things for us. You gave your son for us. Help us to realize that that came with a price. Salvation is free, but it came with a price. And we know what that price was, Father. Your son hang upon that tree and bore the sins of the world. We have put him there. Help us realize that that gift is given to each and every one of us, Father. We don't realize it yet. We, may we soon come to. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Father. Thank you for answering them. You've answered them so many times. And thank you for each and every day of life that you give us. For it is truly a gift. And we pray, Father, that we might live it to the best of our ability and do the best we can with what we can. Continue to be with us throughout this day, this Next hour or two of worship, Father, we're here for you this morning. It's not about us, it's about you. And we pray all this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Sing this next song to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. He left the splendor.
Last week we set a context to the Passover for the Lord's Supper. Each week we participate in the greatest cedar of all. And to think about it in that way will provide us context for what we're doing here today. I told you last week that there are five Sundays and then at some point I'd be reading out of Isaiah 53 if you were paying attention to that, today's the day. But I think it's also important for us to think about the fact that it takes this sacrifice for us to have a seat at the table. And so as we uh, think about the context from Isaiah, I'm going to choose a little different translation today. So from Isaiah 53, who believes our report? To whom is the arm of Adonai revealed? For before him he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He was not well formed or especially handsome. We saw him, but his appearance did not attract us. People despised and avoided him. A man of pains, well acquainted with illness, like someone from whom people turned their faces. He was despised. We did not value him. In fact, it was our diseases he bore, our pains which he suffered. Yet we regarded him as punished, stricken and afflicted by God. But he was wounded for our crimes, crushed because of our sins. The disciplining of us that makes us whole fell on him, and by his bruises we are healed. Let us pray. Father God, as we gather around your table, we are so thankful that you gave the perfect sacrifice of your son. That you went about it this way. That you brought him from a place where we wouldn't think of in normal worldly thoughts that he would come from. But yet you exalted him above everyone else. Not by a coronation in the kingdom, Father, but by coronation on the cross. And as we think of his body today, let us truly reflect on what was done for us to have a seat at the table. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
be reading again from Isaiah. I ask that you think long and hard about what this says, about what was required for us to have a seat at the table for this supper. Though mistreated, he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to be slaughtered, like a sheep silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. After forcible arrest and sentencing, he was taken away. And none of his generation protested his being cut off from the land of the living for the crimes of my people who deserve the punishment themselves. He was given a grave among the wicked. In his death, he was with the rich man. Although he had done no violence, had said nothing deceptive. Yet it pleased Adonai to crush him with illness. To see if he would present himself as a guilt offering. If he does, he will see his offspring and he will prolong his days. And at his hand, Adonai's desire will be accomplished. Let us pray. Father, it is with reverent awe and yet with great thanksgiving that we gather around this table to celebrate the blood of Christ. Because it shows that what was said here in these words of yours did come to fruition. That he, without protest, being the guiltless Lamb of God, laid his life down so that we might have a seat at the table. Father, as we remember how we are passed over today by his blood, let us be ever thankful and in awe of what our brother and our Savior has done for us. In Christ's name, amen.
Let us pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, as we come before you again, let us always count our blessings. Let us be thankful for your grace, love, and mercy as we take this part to give back to you. Help us always give our first fruits to you each and every day. And in Christ's name, amen. Let's all stand. We'll sing two more songs and then we'll turn the services over to Brother Charles before the lesson. All day long of Jesus I am singing.
Good morning. I'm sure you've heard the story about the guy who went to the doctor. He was having some serious health concerns, and so he made an appointment and uh, took his wife. They showed up at the doctor. And of course, the doctor, you know, doing uh, his examination and observing his condition and taking notes, uh, he said, I, I'd ask if you don't mind to step out. I'd like to speak with your wife for a little while, and, uh, and then I'll come out and share. She'll come out and share the news with you. And so he was a little worried, obviously, as many of us would be, and he walked out. And his wife sat there with the doctor, and he said, well, I want to tell you it's not good. But if you will rub your husband's feet every day, if you'll fix him a good home-cooked meal, and you'll just bring it in and just take it right to his easy chair, let him eat right there, and Andy, this is, this is how it's going to work out for you. It's just, it's just listen up here. It's going to work out this way. So, but if you'd take his food to his easy chair, let him eat there, you'd clean up the house every day. You'd have everything just prepped just right for him. said, he'll live a long life. But if you don't, he won't. Well, she took it all in. She listened and she thought, you know, and, and, and you know, careful consideration. She walked out. She sat down by her husband and she patted his knee and he said, well, go ahead and give it to me. I can handle it. And she said, you got one week to live. <laughs> <laughs> right? Guys, how many of us are there? We got one week, right? Uh, it's not that the prescription is hard, it's just that those of us who are spiritually sick aren't willing to listen to what the great physician says for us to be healed. I love the story, and many of you, some of you may have heard this story. This is one of those that goes around, the illustrations that goes around with preachers. And the story is of... Uh, Sherlock Holmes and Watson, they were out camping one night, and as they were out camping, uh, of course, Holmes looks over at Watson, and he looks up at the stars, and he says, Watson, what do you see up there? And Watson said, well, I see thousands and thousands upon thousands of stars, and he says, well, well, Watson, what does all of that mean? What does that mean to you? And here was his reply. He said, I, I suppose it means that we are most fortunate to inhabit God's great universe as intelligent observers. Although we are small in his eyes, we are blessed with powers of reasoning that no other creation of God has. I guess that's what it means to me. Holmes, what does it mean to you? And looking up at the stars, he said, Watson, I suppose that while we were sleeping, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> I think we're living in a day and age where someone has stolen our moral tent. As a matter of fact, we're living in a time where almost anything is accepted. And sadly, Christians are buying into that deception over and over and over again. If you have a Bible, I want you to look with me for just a moment at uh, Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we have this uh, passage uh, of Scripture that is somewhat, in, in many ways, very disturbing. And it's disturbing for a number of reasons... It's disturbing because uh, as we think about this particular passage, we, we oftentimes think about the people who are involved in sin, who have given their lives over to sin, and, and, and we know what the Bible says about that. We know that one day God will close the curtains of this life and we will uh, answer for our deeds. We will answer for uh, the things that we have done in this life. And we, we get that. We know that the Bible speaks out clearly and plainly about sin. And yet, at times, we have a tendency, as God's people, to embrace it. The reason I say this is a very haunting passage, um, he has 
talked a little bit in Romans chapter 1 about the unrighteousness of man and the righteousness of God and how those two things will clash. And at the end of this chapter, one of the things he says in verse... Uh, well, if you look at verse 28 in Romans chapter 1, I, I want to focus on verse 32. But in Romans 1 verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a base mind. Now he's talking about people in the world who are living immorally. To do those things which are not fitting. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, striving, deceit, uh, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, undeserving, uh, I'm sorry, undiscerning untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Man, you want to talk about a lesson, there's one right there. And we know that people in the world are living like that. Our moral compass in this country, our, our tent has been stolen. Now, I'm not saying that, that this country is the people of God. That's not what I'm saying this morning. But one of the things I do want us to realize is that in this country... From the founding of this country, we had a moral direction. We had a sense of understanding that there was a God and that His Word meant something, whether everyone bought in or not. That was at the founding of this country. We are no longer living in those days, sadly. But for us, the church, the people of God, look at verse 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God. Now, he's writing to the church that he is Paul. He's writing to the people of God. And he, as he closes this thought out, he says, those people, you people, who know the righteous judgment of God, that one day those two things will clash and, clash and God will bring his judgment on a wicked and immoral world. He says, the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. There's no question there with us, right? We know that people who are, don't belong to God, who live immorally, one day they're going to be judged. That's part of what Jesus says himself. But notice this, that those who practice such things are, are deserving of death. Not only do the same, that goes back to the people who know better, the church, not only do the same, but also, there it is, approve of those who practice them. Again, we're living in very difficult times. Tommy even mentioned that in his prayer. We're living in very trying times. I think the challenge for us is not to approve of the immorality that's happening around us. As the people of God, the church, we must be different. We must be better. I told you for a few weeks, I mentioned this last week, we're going to think about 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And we're going to look at that verse, and we're going to share some thoughts from that verse. Uh, I want to take something that's mentioned kind of in the middle, maybe a little closer to the end of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I'm going to kind of pull this out, and I'm going to start with the idea of turning first before we look at the rest of it. But the passage is something to this effect. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's our thought this morning, then I will he hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. I want to tell you there's nothing wrong with as a nation thinking about the righteous judgment of God. There's nothing, because it doesn't the Bible say that righteousness exalts a nation? And I will tell you that if you want this nation to change, if you want this nation to turn, it starts with you and me. It doesn't happen from the top down. It doesn't happen with the right person in, the, in office, although I would love for my pick to be in the office. I mean, I want my person to be in, in the highest office of this land. But it starts, it changes, it turns when you and I do what God has anticipated, expected for us to do as His people. We must...
find our missing values. And we must be the best people we can possibly be. I, I want to start and think about this lesson today, turning or to turn. I, I want us to think about it from the concept that is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 17 through 20. So if you've got a Bible, and don't mind opening up to Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning with verse uh, 17. Uh, and let, let me say this. I just want to throw this little caveat out there. Um, I, I am not one who believes in Christian nationalism. And I'm not even going to describe what all of that means, but it is a uh, kind of a, I, I would say more of a political slash religious agenda, thinking that this nation is the children of God. And certainly that's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. And so if you've got some candidate or some president that stands up there and starts quoting verses like he is God's chosen and he's leading this nation, his people, do not listen to him. Do not. That's just a guy wanting votes. And he knows that if he can manipulate Christians into thinking his way, he'll get them. Now, I will say I am going to vote for the guy who is more in line with what I believe the Bible teaches than any, any other candidate. I, I'm going to throw that out there too. But I want us to understand we are the people of God, the church, and that as God's people, we must decide and choose which direction we're going if we're going to turn back to Him. And so this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning with verse 17, you might remember here Moses forces the children of Israel to make a decision. Now, now, sadly, they don't choose right. So I'm going to tell you that up front and not even get into the uh, background of this particular verse. I just want to, mention, I, I want to mention this verse because I want you to see that God gives us a choice. Now, hopefully, we won't be like the children of Israel. Hopefully, as we turn, we make the best decision. But listen to these verses in verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 30. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You want to chase what the world's chasing? The end result is not good. So he says that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which uh, you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Here it is. Choose life. Decide to follow God. Accept His word. Accept His will. Accept His way. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. Verse 20, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you might cling to Him, for He is your life. And the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give to them. Here Moses is saying, listen, God is giving you a choice. I don't think that that ended with Moses and the children of Israel. I think that and believe that that is true for us today, that God wants us to turn. If we will turn from our wicked ways, it is true that God will tune in and He will heal and He will forgive. That, that, that passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 is a beautiful, beautiful passage. And we'll think about it more over the coming weeks. But let's focus for just a moment. Let's focus for just a moment on this particular passage. What does God want? God desires that we turn to Him. I mean, that's always been the case. When He had that special people, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, that's what He longed for. That didn't change when Jesus came. When Jesus came, He was the fulfillment of all of that. All of Israel's history was pointing to Jesus. And all of these biblical truths that were so embedded in the Old Testament that we read and that we study, that we teach our children, are applicable for us today. That just as God longed for His children, the children of Israel, to turn, He longs for His people, the church, to turn. He, he says, as a matter of fact, concerning you and me, the church, 
that, that we are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are his own special people. We're his possession. We're saved by his grace through the blood of his son. And what does he want? He wants us to, to turn. He desires for us to turn. Look, look back at Deuteronomy 30 and back up a little bit. We started in verse 17 a moment ago. Look at verses 15 and 16. Notice that God gives us choice a choice. He gave the children of Israel a choice. Notice what he says. He says, see, I have set before you today good, uh, life and good, death and evil. Choices. You get to choose. Life, the end result, good. Death, the end result, evil. Or evil, the end result, death. Uh, he's given choices. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, walk in His ways, to keep His commands, His statutes, and His judgment, uh, judgments, that you may live and multiply the Lord your God. And what's He going to do? He's going to bless this land. He's going to give you the possessions He promised. Well, that's true for you and me. God's made promises to us. We have a, our citizenship in heaven. One day we will be heirs with King Jesus, our elder brother of all that God has decided to give him and, and us through him. All spiritual blessings, Paul says in Ephesians 1, are in Christ Jesus. We have the promise of living with God forever, eternally. I, I don't know about you, but I, I had a... I had a uh, I, it was an, he was actually an elder of mine at the time. And he had some unique beliefs, and I won't go into that this morning. But one time he told me we were having a discussion, and I'd preached on heaven. And we had a Monday morning men's breakfast. And so he was at that breakfast, and he pulled me aside, and he, he said, you talked all about heaven like it's this place God's prepared for us, and it's some far off distant place, and we're going to get it in the future and all that. And he said, I'm telling you that heaven can be experienced right here and right now. He said, heaven is here. And I looked at him, and I didn't really want to delve into that theologically. I just told him that if this is heaven, I'm a little bit disappointed. I want to tell you, we live in a world where there's heartache, there's sickness, there's death, there's separation. Over and over and over, we're disappointed. You know, bad things are happening. You know, I, I, I find it interesting that a lot of times we will talk about all the good things that are going on in our life, and we'll get a new car. We'll, God wanted me to have... And I'm thinking, with all the problems in the world and all that's going on, and this is how God operates, it is true that we live in a very sad, sad world, right? And we're longing for a homeland, a better place. God has promised us our promised land, our Canaan, if you will, and it's heaven. And, and those promises are realized in Jesus Christ. And, and so again, it's, it's a choice that we have to decide. Are we going to turn? And Are we going to long for heaven? Are, is our citizenship there? Is that what, what, what we're anticipating? Not that we just want to get to a place where there's no more sickness and all of that, which I want to tell you, I'm longing for that. But we get to be with God. He's the reason we want to be there. He is the reason we're longing for heaven. He's the reason we're longing for our homeland. Jesus, our elder brother, is there waiting on us and preparing for us this beautiful place. But notice, he says, I've given you life and good, death and sin. And I want you to understand there's no middle ground. You know, we, we often say things like, it's my way or the highway. With Jesus, there's no highway option. It's just my way. We need to turn and listen to God through Jesus, the one through whom God has spoken in these last days, Hebrews, 11, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. But when we turn away from God, what happens? We stop listening to the voice of God. Our hearts end up growing cold. We replace God with dot, 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 you fill in the blank, some false God. When our hearts grow cold and we've replaced God, that will ultimately lead us to spiritual death. But I want us to think about this. God's desire is that we turn, right? That's what his desire is, that, that we turn. 
But he says, I will re- if you return, I will turn. I, if you repent, I will come. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But, but that's what, what he wants us to do is, he says, I'll return if you repent. You remember that passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You know, my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then there's that little word, then. Then. And what's the next two words? I will. God says, you repent and I will. I will heal and I will forgive. How many, would lo- how many of you would love for this land to once again be a righteous land? How many of us long for that? How many of you get sick of listening to the radio and watching the TV and reading the news and seeing all of the immorality? How many of us, you know, we, we're, we're tired of that. And we want something better. I will tell you, church, if we decide that we're going to be better, this community will be better. If we decide that we're going to be better, we're going to turn to God and He returns to us, you know what? This land will be better. It's dependent upon you and me and not someone else. God's longing for us to return to Him. And God will return if He will repent. I heard someone uh, in a prayer one time, and I appreciated the sentiment, and they were talking about how it doesn't appear that God is in our land anymore. Well, I want to tell you He is, and He's in the church, and this church is in this land, so God is here. But I appreciate the sentiment because I understood what they were saying. They were saying, basically, when we look out and we see all of the immorality around us, we realize that it doesn't appear that God's in this land. Well, I want to tell you, is God in this place, yes or no? Yes, He is here today, for sure. For sure. But I want you to understand that God is in this place and people will see him if we will stand up and be the people God has intended for us to be. I will tell you back to that illustration about listening to the prescription, from, uh, from listening to what the doctor says. Repentance is the hardest pill to swallow. It, it is. Because I, I have to accept that that I'm not who I need to be and that God wants me to be better and He wants me to turn and I've got to approach Him. I've got to bow my head and my knees before a holy God and I must change. And it takes a lot of overcoming our personal pride to do that. It's the hardest pill to swallow. Again, God says, turn from your wicked ways. God will tune in when we turn around. Have you heard Malachi chapter 3 verse 7? Malachi chapter 3 verse 7, Return to me and I will return to you. If you don't think God is in this country, my question is, where are you? Because if you are turning, God is here. If we're running alongside with the world in the direction the world's going, He may not be. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5, repent or perish, twice he mentions that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, what's God's not slow concerning his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient, wanting every one of us to repent. Or you might remember Acts chapter 17, verse 30, when Paul is there on Mars Hill and he's preaching to those very intellectual individuals there. And he talks about this unknown God. And he says, God at one time overlooked the ignorance of all these people, but now he demands that everyone repent everywhere. That is God's message. Paul's words to King Agrippa, Acts chapter 26, verse 20. If you had the opportunity to talk to one of the political figures in our country that holds a high position, let's say the president, What would you say to him? Would you just be enamored to be in his presence? Would you shake his hand and thank him for leading our country? What would you say to the man who sits in the the highest place in our country? Paul had an opportunity to do that. Paul said that I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Is that what you would say to the president? of the United States of America? Well, I'm not so sure what we would say to him 
but I know what God is saying to us. We must turn around. But not only that, what does it mean to turn? We're talking about repentance. We're talking about all this turning. What does it mean? What does it mean to turn? I I think one of the things it, it meant for them, and I would say the same is true for us, it means that we destroy our idols. And we've all got them. In various forms, in various ways, we have idols. And it means that if we're going to repent, we need to destroy those. You might ask, well, what really are our idols today? Well, for the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27, that long text, it was his possession. His possessions got the best of him. That was the thing that was between him and God. That was his idol, and that might be ours as well. It could be work or sports, politics. It could come from a bottle or from a screen. It could come from the very pride that dwells in your heart and mine. But I want you to know that while that lesson may be very negative when we deal with our idols, understand that Jesus, our elder brother, J.B. not only gives us an opportunity to be at the table, but he says, I will give you the strength to overcome what's separating you from your God. I can do all things, Philippians 4.13, through Christ who gives me strength. That's, that, that's what it means to turn. To turn away from our idols and depend on Jesus to help us in our time of need. I think finally we just need to remember that we must turn to Jesus. Isn't that what God's wanting us to do, to turn to Jesus? Isn't God longing for us, desiring for us to turn, and specifically to get rid of our idols and to replace Jesus in our hearts and His grace and His mercy? That's the whole reason Jesus came. He came so that we could be saved, so that God could heal our land and forgive our sins. That's the reason Jesus came. There's a story of a man named Michael Carter. Uh, I think I've alluded to this before, but Michael Carter was an individual that was convicted of robbing a convenience store in Boston. Michael Carter was asked to stand in a lineup before he was convicted. He was asked to stand in a lineup with other criminals to be identified, observed and identified, and so he's in this lineup, and he, he gets offended. He's a little offended that they've actually asked him to stand in a lineup with other criminals. And he said, I don't know why that would work. He said, I was wearing a mask anyway. <laughs> I'm not saying he's smart. Mask wearing. There's a lot of people who practice that well mask wearing. It's the most popular mask of all masks to wear, and especially in religion, it's one of the most popular to wear. We might be able to conceal from everyone else what's really in our hearts, but the one that we will not hide it from is God. And that's why He longs for us to turn. God's not moved unless our hearts are engaged Unless we tune in. I I want you to know, we can can be here this morning, we can sit here this morning, and we can sing, and we can observe the Lord's Supper, and we can give, and we can listen. But unless our hearts are engaged, God's not moved. We must rekindle that fire that burns in our hearts for Jesus. A fire must be rekindled or it will go out. And so once again, I want to just at least mention by way of just saying this. You know, a moment ago I talked about how when we end up not turning, our hearts grow cold. And I want to ask you this morning, is your heart cold? have Have you walked away very quietly and slowly from God where you don't even recognize it? But you're cold. What are the symptoms of a cold heart? Number one, prayer is not a vital part of your life anymore. 
Number two, you're content with your biblical understanding. You don't hunger and thirst for righteousness. Number three, you rarely have thoughts about eternal things. Number four, gatherings and fellowships with God's people are not desired by you. As a matter of fact, you don't even want to be there. Potential spiritual discussions that are pointed are often embarrassing. Making money or the madness of materialism dominates your thinking. Sin doesn't bother your conscience anymore. Remember, those who know the righteous judgment of God approve of those very things. Not only do them, but also approve of those very things. And the fact that people are dying all around us doesn't even seem to cross our mind. There's no sense of God's presence in our lives. You're more excited about the cardinals than Christ. Uh, that, that one was for me. You think more about yourself than you do God. Th those are symptoms of a heart that's growing cold. Ted Koppel in 1998 gave a commencement address to Stanford University. And among many things, he said, we will not change what's wrong with our culture through legislation or by choosing upsides on the basis of personal popularity or party affiliation. He says, we will change it by small acts of courage and kindness, by recognizing each of us his or her own obligations to set a proper example that's kind of what God was saying, wasn't it? Choose life. Aspire to decency, practice civility toward one another. Admire and uh, uh, emulate ethical behavior wherever you find it. Apply a rigid standard of morality to your lives. And if periodically you fail, and surely you will, adjust your lives, not the standards. I, sadly, I think we have adjusted the standards. He would go on to say, this is no great mystery here, and that's one of the things actually in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 11 that, that God said to his people through Moses. This is not too complex or hard to understand. He said, there's no mystery here. You know what to do. Now go out and do it. God just requires one thing that we turn. I don't know your heart, you don't know mine. But I'm guessing in an assembly like today, someone needs to step out and turn. And so Ben's going to lead us in an invitation song. He's beautifully led us in this worship so far. You've heard the word of God. Now I'm encouraging you, step out in faith toward Jesus. If we can help you, please come while together we stand.
Um, just let me mention this uh, very quickly. I, I do know that we have several that are uh, wanting to place membership with our spiritual family here. For that, we are certainly grateful. Uh, Alan and JB have been doing a beautiful job to lead us as a spiritual family, to reach out to those who want to be a part of the spiritual flock. As spiritual shepherds, they're trying to communicate with everyone, and sometimes that becomes a little challenging, but we're thankful that Jim and Sherry Holt were able to visit with Alan and JB last week. And, and I, I loved the message that I got from JB uh, after service was uh, over and Bible classes were starting. He said, uh, Jim and Sherry Holt are our newest members, and certainly we welcome them this morning. They are sitting to my right. If you don't mind raising your hands, I want to ask you to stand. But so grateful for Jim and Sherry Holt. And again, I know uh, we have several others that have... Uh, 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 a desire to be a part of us. This is just an exciting and beautiful part uh, of our church family here, and we're thankful for you being a part of, of us now. So thankful. It's good to see you. Got a few uh, prayer requests for this morning um, before we end in a closing prayer. Uh, prayers requested for Elaine McBride. Um, she will be having surgery at the end of the month. Um, also, prayers for Paula White, um, who is in Lincoln Medical Center. Um, also, congratulations to Brandon and Camille Childers on the birth of their son, Mason Hugh Childers. Mason was born on Tuesday, July 4th, weighing 7 pounds, 1 ounce, and 18 and a half inches long. Uh, congratulations also to big sister Abby and proud grandparents Tim and Shirley Childers. Um, also, please be um, in prayers for uh, the Patrick family. Um, heard news that uh, Chuck Patrick passed away last night, so please be in prayer with that family. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this uh, wonderful day you've given us um, to just come here and worship you, and thank you for giving us the opportunity and the freedom to do so, Lord. Um, God, just thank you for um, Charles' sermon today. Um, help, it to, um, help us to take it to heart and just uh, carry that out through, our, through the week and um, just help, it, uh, help us to just follow your word, Lord. And God, just uh, thank you for um, just all the many blessings that you've given us. Um, God, that's, we just ask that um, you please be with all the people mentioned in the prayer request, Lord, and uh, everyone else who uh, was not mentioned, Lord. Um, please be with them and comfort the, the families. And God, we just want to thank you for your son who died on the cross to save us from our sins. It's your name that we pray. Amen.